Well, good morning, everyone. Official good morning to you. <laughs> welcome to all of y'all that are here joining us at Gray's this morning, and welcome to y'all that are joining us via live stream. So good to be together on the second Sunday of Easter. God, it's such a wonderful thing. Even, I was reminded, even with the busyness of trying to get things set up this morning, we don't come here for a performance. We don't come here to get things right, except perhaps to get things right with God. But otherwise, we don't come here to try and execute perfection. We come here out of our love for Jesus and what he's done in our lives and drawing us together as a community and to receive from him what he wants to give. And in this Easter season, the scripture reading this morning in the daily lectionary, I just wanted to read part of it to you. It's from the letter, the very opening of the letter to the Hebrews. It goes like this. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, these days in which we're living, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed. doubts of Easter, welcome. This is the place to be. You're going to hear a, a lot about doubting today because our, the one we hear about a lot, Thomas, we're going to get to meet him face to face this morning. So come with your doubts. There's no fear for, here for that because we're here to encounter the living Jesus. Lead us, please. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. And together, Almighty God, 
To you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord be with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, who in the Paschal mystery established the new covenant of reconciliation, grant that all who have been reborn into the fellowship of Christ's body may show forth in their lives what they profess by their faith. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for the reading of God's Word. The first reading today... It is from Isaiah. In that day, this song will be sung in the land of Judah. We have a strong city. He sets up salvation as walls and bulwarks. Open the gates that the righteous nation that keeps faith may enter in. You keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for the Lord God is an everlasting rock. For he has humbled the inhabitants of the height, <coughs> excuse me, the height of the lofty city. He lays it low, lays it low to the ground, casts it to the dust. The food, the foot tramples it, the feet of the poor, the steps of the needy. The path of the righteous is level. You make level the way of the righteous in the path of your judgments, O Lord. We wait for you. Your name and remembrance are the desire of our soul. My soul yearns for you in the night. My spirit within me earnestly seeks you. For when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. The word of the Lord. Be 
this morning, we will say Psalm 111, uh, responsively by whole verse. Praise the Lord. I will give thanks unto the Lord with my whole heart in the company of the upright and among the congregation. His work is worthy to be praised and held in honor, and his righteousness endures forever. He has made his marvelous works to be had in remembrance. The Lord is gracious and merciful. He has given food to those who fear him. He shall ever be mindful of his covenant. The works of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are true. They stand fast forever and ever, and are God and true in heaven. He sent redemption to his people. He has commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The second reading is from 1 John. Everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ has been born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves whoever has been born of him. By this we know that we love the children of God, when we love God and obey his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not burdensome, For everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Who is it that overcomes the world except the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God? The word of the Lord. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. On the evening of that day, the first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so am I sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. Now Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, 
unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Eight days later, his disciples were inside again and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands and put out your hand and place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, you promise that on the day of Jesus' return, we will see him in person, face to face. Until that great day, through your grace, we are those who have not seen, yet believed. Amen. You may be seated. Are there any kids who'd like to come up? I kind of have a special picture. If not, that's okay, too. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. <clears throat> I'm not sure how I'm going to do this <laughs> without this mic. So, kids here and kids at home, you see a big question mark there, huh? Okay, yeah. You see a big question mark here. That question mark is there because sometimes we just have to think a little bit about what somebody might say. So let's say that I tell you that I can put 100 marshmallows in my mouth all at once. You think about that and you say, yeah, no, I don't think so. But we think that'd be the best sermon illustration ever, if you would. <laughs> I doubt that's going to happen. <laughs> I doubt that's going to happen. I know when, my, uh, when I was growing up, I don't know what your parents say to you when they want to say, hey, you know, that's never going to happen. Not in my lifetime. What my mother used to say was, that'll happen when pigs fly. Can pigs fly? Are you sure? You're very, very sure. Well, I think Thomas might agree, might agree with you. If I told Doubting Thomas that pigs fly, he would probably look like, yeah, no. You know, that crazy lady, no. However, sometimes we need proof in order to make our doubts wash away. So I have proof 
that pigs can fly. They have to, yeah. I have proof that pigs can fly. So when I was a teacher, um, I taught in middle school, and there were times in which the middle school kids would say something like, oh, can I go wander around the halls for a while? And I would point to that. You can do that when pigs fly. So now you have proof pigs can fly. <laughs> Thank you. There's some things about us that we just have naturally. Think about how children look. Every child receives some features from his or her parents, like red hair, brown eyes. I get this hair from my grandfather, who also turned gray and white when he was 26. Yeah, pigs flew brown eyes or a certain shape of your nose or your chin. And sometimes we think faith is like that too. We say, I'm pretty sure I have faith because my parents have faith. Kind of runs in the family. Or we make the assumption, I have faith because I grew up in the church. But faith isn't like that. And it doesn't come naturally. Faith is a gift of God. Why, do we, why does God have to give us this gift? Because by ourselves, we're all dead. By ourselves, we don't even have a drop of God-pleasing stuff. Quite naturally, all human beings reject the good things of the Lord, and every one of us would be lost in wickedness and condemned for lack of faith. So I bet you're ready for some good news. We are not lost or condemned. We're not conforming to the patterns of this world. We are being transformed by God. We are walking in the newness of life. John's gospel is one place where we find out the linking of faith with life. That is the application of his entire gospel. Well, now, today, it's eight days after the risen Jesus walks out of the tomb. The disciples had had quite a week. One might even liken it to a roller coaster ride. As Jesus entered Jerusalem on a donkey, they had been filled with great joy. But the excitement of his triumphal entry soon ended. Just four days later, Jesus was betrayed by Judas. He was hunted down, abandoned by his disciples, arrested by soldiers, and put on trial. To them, it must have all seemed nonsensical. In the hands of the Romans, we know Jesus was knocked around and flogged and ridiculed until the sentence of death was handed down by Pilate. There followed the torture of the cross spikes hammered into his hands and feet, and an agonizing death by suffocation. Then came blood and water rushing out of his pierced chest. Finally, Jesus' lifeless body was taken down and buried. To the disciples, it looked like all was lost. To the point where they cowered in hiding on that Sabbath, which actually starts sundown on Friday and lasts through sundown on Saturday. They cowered in hiding for fear of the Jews. If they were found, would they be beaten, flogged, ridiculed, crucified? But then came the rush of Easter Sunday. The disciple ran to Jesus' tomb and they found it empty. And that same hour, Mary Magdalene was met by the Lord Jesus himself, not dead, but alive, not bruised and bloodied, but changed and glorified. The risen Lord sends Mary to tell the others. They do not have to wait long to see how wonderfully true her report was. Later that same day, 
when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. They don't have to grieve. They don't have to fear because he is alive. And Jesus wants to make sure his disciples know that it's him. So what did he do? He showed them his hands and his side. His body had been changed and glorified, but the wounds were still visible. The disciples saw where the nails had been, saw where the spear had pierced his side. This was no phantom Jesus. This was no dream. This was their flesh and blood Jesus, alive and well, still bearing the marks of what he'd been through. Compare it to how people tell stories of their scars. I have enough scars on my body to take up the rest of the sermon, but we won't go there. <laughs> Somebody might pull up a pant leg and say, you see this scar? Knee surgery back in 98. Or see this burn mark? I actually have a burn mark from the um, pancake dinners we used to have up at St. Margaret's when somebody opened the oven door and I forgot about that. <laughs> see that burn mark from an accident at work? In a way, that cannot be argued. Scars confirm a person's story. Those marks in our skin connect us to what happened, even if it's decades in the past. So when the disciples see Jesus' hand and side, John tells us they were glad. They really knew it was him. But think about why Jesus has done this. He showed himself not to give them a last curious look before he went to heaven. No. Jesus had a specific purpose in appearing on that day. For these were his disciples the men who would first bring the message of his salvation into the world. That is why, right after Jesus appears, he gives a mission mandate. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. J just as he will also commission them before he ascends into heaven, here Jesus sends his disciples out. Now that you've seen me, Go and preach to all nations. Now that you know how true my message is, now that you know that I have risen from the grave, go tell everyone, the Father sent me, now I'm sending you. Tell it with boldness. Well, a week passes, and then Jesus appears to his disciples again. The first time he showed himself, Thomas wasn't there. We don't know where he was, but a week later, he's there. And when the others tell him, he's skeptical. Thomas says, unless I see in his hands the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. This is what it would take for him to believe. Not just look, but touch. Thomas wanted it to be confirmed beyond any shadow of a doubt. Was the Lord really alive? Was Jesus so alive that you could put your fingers right into the nail holes? Well, you know that Thomas is considered the doubter among the 12. Today, if someone is always skeptical about things, we call him a doubting Thomas. For Thomas doesn't accept the word of his fellow disciples, and he won't even consider how Jesus predicted his resurrection. He sets a high demand before he'll change his mind. I have to see, I have to feel. Yet we shouldn't be too hard on Thomas. For was he such a doubter? Was he any more a doubter than the others? It's hard to say because we hear him in only one other incident in John 11. 
As Lazarus dies, Jesus says to his disciple, let us go to him. Well, Thomas misunderstands. He doesn't think that Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. Instead, he thinks the Lord is planning to go to where Lazarus is, to the place of the dead. So the next thing you know, Thomas says to the other disciples, let us go also, that we may die with him. He didn't get what Jesus was saying, but there's no question that Thomas shows great devotion. He is ready at a moment's notice to die with Jesus. That's not what you would expect from a doubter. Remember, too, that Thomas wasn't the only one to reject the news about the resurrection. All the disciples doubted when the women brought the report. Later, when it was time for Jesus to ascend, some were still unsure. In other words, Thomas wasn't the only doubting Thomas. But Jesus wants them all to know the truth. He understands exactly what Thomas is looking for. Reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Jesus is a teacher who has a lot of patience and care. And he will give Thomas a hands-on lesson. He'll prove the resurrection. Well, did Thomas do it? Did he put his fingers in the holes? The text doesn't say. It might have been enough to see Christ's body with his own two eyes. When Jesus held out his hands, there were the nail holes. When Jesus opened his robe, there was the wound in his side. What do you think about the opportunity that Thomas had? Sometimes it'd be so reassuring, a great confirmation of my faith. Seeing Jesus would put to rest any of those little doubts and uncertainties I may have. To see my Savior in the flesh, just for a moment. Then I'd really be sure. Then I would know my Lord lives and breathes, that he hears my prayers and watches over me. Do you ever wish for that? Well, it won't happen like pigs don't fly. It won't happen. Jesus has ascended and is in heaven. And he told us he's not going to come back until the time is right. Only on the day of his return will we see him in person, face to face. So we are those who have not seen. We are those who have not touched. That's actually close to the heart of true faith. Remember Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of what we hope for, the evidence of things not seen. Notice especially that last phrase. Faith is the evidence of things not seen. We haven't seen Jesus. We won't see. Not yet. So what do we need to do? Well, we don't think, have to think that we're actually missing out. Instead, we need to listen to those who were there. We need to believe those who saw him, people like John and Peter and Paul, and we hear their testimonies whenever we open the scriptures. The scriptures are such a crucial foundation to our faith. God works through them in a way we don't fully understand. But the more we read scripture, the more we study God's word in a spirit of prayer, the more God reinforces that all these things are true. More and more, we have the certainty that these things are real and trustworthy. More and more, we can believe them and build our life on them. As I sought to grow closer to Jesus in prayer one day, I distinctly heard the words, from your head to your heart. 
kind of confusing. After a few days of praying into this message, I actually discovered the dumping of my biblical head knowledge into my heart. For me, it wasn't enough to say, I know Jesus. That's, that was my head knowledge. For me, it was embedding that knowledge into my heart. That is what makes faith complete for me. Seeing Jesus has an immediate effect on Thomas. He cries out, my Lord and my God. The disciple who doubted now becomes absolutely sure of his faith. I believe this is the Lord. I believe this is God. His master now stands in resurrection glory. Those nails, that cross, the spear, none of this could destroy the Christ. Thomas cries out his confession. Yet Jesus has something to say. Jesus says, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who haven't seen and yet have believed. Thomas was sure of his Savior because he could see him in the flesh. And not to say the faith of Thomas wasn't blessed. Remember, it had to be this way. This disciple went on to be used by Christ for great things. Thomas is said to be the first who brought the gospel to Asia, traveling as far as India. This was a real confession of faith a real faith granted by his God. When John sat down to write the words of this gospel, there were still many, many people who had seen Jesus. He'd been around for more than 30 years and had a ministry for three. Hundreds, thousands had witnessed what he could do, his miracles, his teachings, But as the church grew and as time went on, more and more Christians will never see Christ in person. It was just a small number, actually, who ever got the chance to see Jesus. Well, we live in a time when that's considered to be a serious problem in our day. If there's not a picture of something, it didn't happen. Even more, if there's not a video clip of it somewhere, it didn't take place. Actually, that's how it's always been. People need to see. There is an implicit trust in what, we, in what can be touched and handled. And there is a, suspension about, a suspicion about what is unseen. What about us? Every Sunday, we remember the resurrection of Jesus to celebrate an event that no one saw. There are no photos. There is no grainy footage hidden somewhere on YouTube. And yet, we believe. We're even certain of what we confess. How's that happened? How has God granted the amazing gift of faith How has he worked it in us? If you read just one verse after our text, John writes, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. This 21-chapter gospel is just a sampling of all that Jesus said and did. Yet these 21 chapters have a monumental purpose. John says, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. That's how we know. Through the word. In the word, we can't see him, but we can hear him. We can hear his words of grace and wisdom. In the word, we can't touch him, but we can be touched by his Holy Spirit, and we can be moved by his power. This is how God brings about the miracle of faith. In many of our homes, our parents read the Bible and and still do read the Bible. And they spoke to us and speak to children about the word. 
At church, in worship, and in Sunday school classes, teachers explain God's word to us year after year. I was one of those people that didn't listen so well back then. But there are people that kept reading the scriptures at mealtimes, in devotional times with families, in study group. God used all of that to bring us to faith. Without ever seeing him, we can know the living Christ. We know his hands were punctured by nails. We know his side was pierced. We know he died on the cross and that he came back to life on the third day. Though it happened many centuries ago, we can know it from the word. There is another great encouragement for us to remain in scriptures, to read and study the word of God each and every day of our life, to make sure that we're ready to hear it preached on Sunday, that we're prepared to hear it today and ready to work with it. And what an encouragement for parents to keep opening the scriptures with the children. Teach your children the ABCs of who God is what he does, and what he commands. These are the building blocks of faith. We need the word because like Thomas, and actually like the other disciples, we can sometimes doubt. We weaken in our conviction. Sometimes we find God's words hard to believe, or we simply forget what he told us. So we start to wonder, what if that's not true? How can we know? What if we spent our life believing a fraud? Well, we can wrestle with all of our doubts and uncertainties, and it isn't doubt that is often near the root of anxieties. We don't always live in the fullness of knowing God's truth. We don't always enjoy the refuge of that certainty. We can be like the man in Mark 9, asking Jesus for his son to be healed, he cried out with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. Faith and unbelief are in the same heart. In times of sickness and stress, a person might realize more than ever his helplessness, and he might be moved to see the Lord's strength. But then, in times of health and prosperity and success, we start to trust our own ability again while our dependence on God weakens. For months, we don't look to God with a childlike attitude of trust because we feel like we have everything under control. We can be caught between our doubts, being pushed back and forth like the waves of the ocean. Could God really forgive what I've done? I doubt it. Or will I ever make progress in my faith? I doubt it. Am I able to bear under all this suffering? Or is God really going to lead my life in the coming years? I kind of doubt it. In times like these, we need to doubt our doubts. And we should believe our beliefs. Because we believe in a God who doesn't change. We believe in a God who never fails, never lies. We know who we believe, we know he is faithful. We know that Jesus who appeared on that day is no phantom. He isn't walking around on this earth beside us physically, but he's not distant. When we ask him to, he gives us the power to change. When we ask him to, the ascended Christ gives the heart to serve the ability to understand, and the faith to believe. In his first letter, Peter writes of this amazing work of God. Peter was another eyewitness who brought the message of Christ to many people. And he writes to some of these believers, though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. 
When we believe in the risen Christ, he gives joy. Joy because we know that he died and that he died for us and that he also lives again. We have joy because we can echo the confession of Thomas, my Lord and my God. And in answer, Jesus promises, blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. The blessing of knowing Christ isn't something that can be measured in dollars or counted in possessions. The blessing is something proven by good, isn't proven by good health or the absence of troubles and afflictions. No, the blessing is that we can be joined to the triune God. We can walk with him by faith and enjoy the abundant life. That's the blessing that endures forever. It is a blessing that one day our faith in the unseen will give way to sight. And then we'll see our Savior face to face. We'll see him just as he is in glory. So as we celebrate the risen Lord Jesus Christ today in our worship and Eucharist, he declares us blessed. You are blessed because Christ is your Lord and God. You are blessed through the risen Jesus, whom you believe, though you have not seen. Amen. Please stand. And let's say together, confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Let us pray for the church and the world, saying, Hear our prayer. For the peace of the whole world and for the well being and unity of the people of God, Lord, in your mercy. For Foley, our Archbishop, and John, our Bishop, and for all the clergy and people of our diocese, especially Christ Anglican Church and Christ Church, and for our congregation, Lord, in your mercy. For all those who proclaim the gospel at home and abroad, and for all who teach and disciple others, especially our missionary partner, Yvonne, and our partner churches in Bolivia, Lord, in your mercy. For our brothers and sisters in Christ who are persecuted for their faith, Lord, in your mercy. For our nation, for those in authority, and for all in public service, especially our President Joe, our Governor Ralph, and our Board of County Supervisors, Lord, in your mercy. 
For those serving in the armed forces or in harm's way, especially Thomas, Steve, Nick, Austin, Bo, Jean, John, Devin, Brian, Linnea, Bryce, Gavin, Marcus, Christy, Tim, John, Evan, Dylan, Zachary, Andrew, Gerardo, Andrew, and Josh. Lord, in your mercy. For the generous gift of the property on Hoadley Road, the Lord's blessing and wisdom for its development and the creation of a mission outpost that brings him honor and glory. Lord, in your mercy. For all whose lives are closely linked with ours, especially Scott, Mary, Thomas, and Hannah, Penny, Kristen, Danny and Alice, Stephen and Helen, Alfonso and Doris, and Jean, and grant that we may serve Christ in them and love one another as he loves us. Lord, in your mercy. For all those who are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity, especially June, Lou, George, Darlene, Randy, Tom, Jim, Jacob, Jenny, Barbara, Clancy, Marlene, Wilburn, Angie, Al, Karen, Vivienne, Charlie, Bibi, Gertrude, Donna, Janice, James, Thomas, Grace, John, Reverend Michael Bamberger, and all those suffering from COVID-19, are there others for whom we should pray? Lord, in your mercy. For all those who have departed this life in the certain hope of the resurrection, in thanksgiving, let us pray. Lord, in your mercy. For those requests which are known to you alone, Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, accept the fervent prayers of your people. In the multitude of your mercies, look with compassion upon us and all who turn to you for help. For you are gracious, O lover of souls. And to you we give glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us humbly confess our sins unto Almighty God. Together, most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done, and by what we have not done. We have not loved you with our whole hearts, we have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry for the wrong we have done. Forgive us our sins, and save us from the fire of us. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who in His great mercy has promised forgiveness of sins to all those who repent and with true faith, faith turn to Him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to Him. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please greet one another with a sign of the Lord's peace. Peace to those of you that are watching at home via live stream. A couple of uh, few announcements just want to bring to your attention. Uh, one, 
just a reminder that we would like to start having resurrection stories each week. Testimonies from people talking about, this is how I have known the resurrected Jesus in my life. Uh, just something very brief and short. We've got someone lined up for next week. We'd love to get volunteers from y'all for, for the weeks to come. I just thought I would share briefly one from me, because it was connecting right in line with Sally, Deacon Sally's call to us that where we do get to hear Jesus and encounter Jesus, one of the primary places is in the scriptures. And when I'm struggling with doubts, which does happen, believe it or not, even for me, a high priest of God, I struggle with doubts and I have really difficult days and I get weary and worn down. And what I keep finding is that when I do take time, not just in the morning, but throughout the day to stop and to turn to just a brief portion of scripture, a brief prayer addressing Jesus directly, things settle in my heart and mind. And even for a moment, there's a reorientation that happens. And my day goes a little bit differently. Things don't necessarily get better themselves, but I see things differently and I respond differently. And as a result, out of that, I've developed kind of my own little practice of, of um, personal spiritual practice that I have of when I start feeling myself getting doubtful, fearful, out of control, I have kind of this pattern that I'm learning to go through of, all right, let me reorient myself to the Lord. Let me receive from him, which comes typically in scripture and in prayer, focusing on Jesus. And then let me respond to what he is saying and doing rather than reacting to the circumstances. Reorienting, receiving, and then responding. And what's crazy, and it's not crazy, is that it makes a difference because Jesus is real. And in my life, I'm experiencing that day to day. Uh, and so that's part of one of my resurrection stories of this, how I live life with the resurrected Jesus. Love to hear more stories. So if you guys would, would volunteer to, to share, it can be as simple and brief as that. We'll get one next week and we'll have more in the weeks to come. Some of these stories are going to be shared this upcoming Saturday is going to be the Superhero Fun Run. Just a reminder that that's happening. I've got one of the flyers here. I don't, do we have more flyers with us at church today, Jordan or Melissa? Okay, so there'll be some outside at the table if you'd like to get some flyers to see what's going on or to hand them out. Still space for volunteers, but especially, please be praying uh, for our team and for those that will be gathering on Saturday at, at Andrew Le Leaked, Liked? Leech, <laughs> Andrew, here's the new guy, Andrew Leech Park, uh, and be praying for that time, 2 to 4 p.m. especially is when you can be praying if you're not there. Set aside like of just a few minutes to pray that the Lord would make himself known on that particular day. Uh, another announcement that I just want, wanted to bring to your attention, um, you guys know that I graduated from Trinity School for Ministry, and their June term is coming up, and I just received some of the flyers. One of them in particular is called Introducing, Understanding, and Exploring the Book of Common Prayer. It's a two-day seminar. It's also going to be online, focusing on the 2019 Book of Common Prayer. It might be something worth exploring, as well as some of the other classes that are on here. They're doing a mix of some are online, some are hybrid. You can even go there if you'd like to go to some of these classes. But I've got uh, some flyers out there if you'd like to, to see if you'd like to join in for one of those classes from Trinity there. Um, two more things I want to ask for prayer on. One is that you would just continue praying for our move team. We're in the final stages of working through all the paperwork, all the numbers, pulling all these things together. And then when, as that comes together with clarity, we're going to be bringing more information to y'all. So please continue in your prayer for them. Both thanksgiving for the immense amount of work that they do and for wisdom as they, they continue leading us in this. And then also to say a thank you to our phone team. Starting a year ago, y'all started calling each other weekly. I've had other, other pastors, other uh, fellow clergy saying, how, Travis, how'd you get this going? How'd you do this? I'm like, this was happening when I got there. That's the kind of people that Emmanuel are. They are already reaching out and loving. We had a phone team in particular throughout this time and wanted to say thanks to, we've got Kathleen Harding, Danny Cade, Jean Ellerby, Alan Clark, Charlie Martin, Cheryl Timmons, Cloellen Miller, Karen Hermans, Kathy Westcott, Kent Avery, Richard Guerin, Terry Barrett, 
Vicki Morse, Karen Guerin, Andy Orovitz, Bill Harding. Y'all, thank you for loving our congregation for a year's worth of phone calls weekly. Yeah. <laughs> we are officially releasing them at this point from doing those weekly phone calls. And so that team, we're, we've prayed over them um, this past week on the, and released them from that. We're still building a list of people who would like to have regular phone calls. And so I have a list of those. If you would like to be someone who receives a regular phone call from a new team that we're putting together, please let me know or email the church office and we'll add you to that list. And there'll be some, for those of folks, especially those of y'all at home that can't get out still, we'd love to stay in contact with you over a phone. Or if there's someone new who would like to get to know us, let us know and we'd be happy to put you on that list and we'll have some of those calls going out on a regular basis also. Uh, final thing that I want to say, we'll be praying about this and doing more. We're saying, we're saying several goodbyes this year. Uh, we've said goodbye. Uh, we didn't get to do it publicly here, but many of y'all know that the Anayas have already moved on and have relocated to a different place. We know that the fuels, Steve and Debbie, where did Steve go? Steve and Debbie are finally relocating permanently to Alabama. Um, I'm actually not going to try to say the football thing because I always get it wrong. All, will, all that will come out is go Steelers, and I know that's right for Dick, but that's not right for over here. But no, we're, I think, roll tight or something like that. Okay, there we go. But So we'll, we'll be loving them and releasing them soon. And then as was announced this week as well, Richard and... Ke uh, Richard. <laughs> it's very formal, so now I'm calling you Richard. Richard and Karen Guerin are going to be leaving us as well, moving up to Pennsylvania to be closer to their daughter and, and son-in-law and grandkids up there. We'll do something formal as the time draws close. But as I said in the pastor's announcement, please be praying for actually for the fuels as well as the Guerins, this uprooting and replanting that the Lord is doing in their lives needs a lot of grace and love and support from us. Um, and we'll be, we'll be telling you more about what it looks like to shift senior wardens during this time, bringing in a, another vestry member to, to finish out his term, and uh, an appropriate farewell and, and gratefulness to Karen and Rich as well. well. We'll get to that in the weeks to come. But just wanted to make sure if you hadn't seen the pastor's corner that y'all have heard about that uh, as well from up front. Fuels, we love y'all. Rich and Karen, we love y'all. And Nayas, if you're watching, we love y'all too and missing you. And goodbyes are hard, but they, we're grateful that there's still family love that extends all the way through that as well. All right. Birthdays and anniversaries. Mike Harpster at home. It's his birthday this week. I know that. Happy birthday, Mike. Owen, is it your birthday? Thursday, yes. Happy birthday to Owen over here. Deb, back to you, yes. Wilbur, back to you as well. Oh, the anniversary for the Alberts. Yay for y'all. Anniversary over here as well for Ann and Maury. Wonderful. We got a lot to pray for today. Anyone on this side? So we're heavily weighted this way. Everyone extend your hands this direction. I'll pray for Mike Harpster and others of you that are at home. Don't forget that some of those hands are going towards Owen over here. And together, let us pray. Watch over your children, O Lord, as their days increase. Bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up when they fall. And in their hearts, may your peace, which passes understanding, abide all the days of their life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now, walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, our duty and our joy, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death he has destroyed death, and by his rising to life again he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. be seated. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had sinned against you and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent your only Son, Jesus Christ, into the world for our salvation. By the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, he became flesh and dwelt among us. In obedience to your will, he stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself once for all, that by his suffering and death we might be saved. By his resurrection he broke the bonds of death, trampling hell and Satan under his feet. As our great high priest he ascended to your right hand in glory, that we might come with confidence before the throne of grace. On the night that he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks... He broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, Jesus took the cup. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, Drink this, all of you. For this is my blood of the new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, and we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your word and Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Sanctify us also that we may worthily receive this holy sacrament and be made one body with him, that he may dwell in us and we in him. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us with all your saints into the joy of your heavenly kingdom where we shall see our Lord face to face. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by Him and with Him and in Him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. 
Alleluia. Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed once for all upon the cross. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. Those of you that are at home and you have the, the Holy Sacrament with you, you may take that in hand now. The gifts of God for the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your hearts by faith with thanksgiving. Those of you at home with the, the, the consecrated host, receive the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. If you don't have that with you, um, there is the prayer for spiritual communion that's in the bulletin and I encourage you to pray that as we continue receiving here at Gray's. Just a reminder that the way that we're receiving now, since we are now receiving the wine again, as you come to the front, put both hands out, uh, one hand over the other like this. Deacon Sally and I will intinct, dip, intinct is the fancy word for it, will intinct the, the bread in the wine very carefully without our fingers touching it. Uh, get the extra, extra off by touching the side of the chalice and then place it into your, your palm there. And then as has been our, our norm now, you can return to your seat, briefly remove the mask and receive the body and blood of Christ that way. Uh, if you're not comfortable receiving in that way at this point, still come forward. If you put one hand across your chest, then we will just give you the bread. Both hands across your chest like this, and we will pray a blessing over you. Um, all are welcome who have been baptized in the name of Jesus and the Father and the Holy Spirit to come and receive.
I invite you to stand. And together let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory now and forever. Amen. Before I send you out with the blessing, just a, a request. Since we got the service started a little late this morning and things are moving a little more slowly now that we're adding things to communion, just a request that you do after the blessing and the, the recessional hymn and the dismissal, head on outside since we need to clear things out of here um, in preparation for folks who are coming this evening. And that'll help our, our setup team if y'all can... can expeditiously <laughs> uh, head out the doors and greet one another outside as well as it helps with our COVID compliance. So thank you for that. Now, you who are loved of the Father, step forward into this new day by the power of the Holy Spirit that you might journey through its hours in the peace and the grace and the love of the risen Son, walking its paths in the light of the hope of our coming redemption. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you and remain with you now and always. Amen. Amen.
Alleluia, alleluia. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord.